I think the next uh, uh, presentation is by Professor Terpos uh, from University of Greece, and it's on update on bone disease in myeloma. Thank you so much, Nikhil. I would like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. We go now to the uh, microenvironment and the uh, interplay between myeloma and uh, uh, bone cells. These are my disclosures. And you all know that, uh, of course, bone disease uh, is the most common complication of multiple myeloma, present in up to 80% of patients at diagnosis, and is characterized by the presence of lytic lesions that many times lead to pathological fracture. It is devastating for the patients with uh, a lot of pain for our patients, hypercalcemia of malignancies, and spinal cord compression. We know from the era of uh, conventional chemotherapy that if we don't uh, use any bone targeted agents, approximately 50% of our patients are going to have a skeletal related event named a pathological fracture in about one third of our patients, need for radiation therapy in another one third, 5% of the patients need surgical intervention and 3% will have spinal cord compression. With uh, the novel agents that we use, namely mainly for botezomib and uh, the IMIT, that first-line therapy, uh, we have a change mainly in the need for radiotherapy. So we continue to see a diagnosis that approximately 26% of the patients, and this is from our series of patients, uh, will have a pathological fracture. 5% will need surgery to bone, and another 5% will have spinal cord compression. But approximately 5% of the patient will need now the radiotherapy uh, if you compare it with the 30% uh, of conventional chemotherapy error, and this is because we have more uh, potent antimyeloma therapies. Regarding uh, data at relapse, and this is the only data that I have seen, 10% um, uh, of the patients who have received the bortezomib-based regimen are going to have a skeletal-related event at first relapse versus 22% for patients who have been treated with an IMID-based regimen without a bortezomib. And uh, regarding pathological fracture, you can see that the majority of these fractures happen, of course, in the vertebral uh, between the T10 and the L3 vertebra. Uh, so the spine is the most common site of the fractures in multiple myeloma. And this is very important because we need to do a lot of work in order to prevent kyphosis, and this is what's happening when we have a lot of fractures in uh, uh, our spine, and kyphosis uh, creates a lot of problems in the patients, not only from the kinetical point of view, but also because of lung infections. And the major uh, cell that uh, is implicating the pathophysiology of bone disease uh, that w we knew from very early years is uh, the osteoclast that you see here. The osteoclast uh, is um, stimulated by several chemokines, one of the most important is rank ligand, and you can see here the osteoclast that uh, uh, resorbs this microcrack. The microcrack is here, then we have this activation of the osteoclast that resorbs the microcrack, and then the osteoblast comes in order to produce the new bone, but the osteoblasts are totally exhausted in multiple myeloma. And the receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B ligand is the most potent uh, activator of the osteoclast. It is produced mainly by the osteocytes that are osteoblasts that have been entombed into the bone that they produced. Osteocyte is the most uh, uh, common cell of uh, the bone. 90% of the cells of the bones are osteocytes. So the osteocytes produce rank ligand, and the rank ligand enhances the differentiation of the osteoclast precursors to mature osteoclast, and also rank ligand inhibits the apoptosis doses of mature osteoclast. So this is the most uh, potent osteoclast activator. Osteoprotegerin, which is produced by the osteoblast, uh, is the decoy receptor of the rank ligand, so it binds rank ligand and it inhibits the whole process that I previously shown to you. So the ratio between the rank ligand and osteoprotegerin drives the osteoclast activity not only in multiple myeloma but in all bone disorders and, of course, in many other uh, malignancies that metastasis to the bone. So in multiple myeloma, the adherence of the myeloma cells to the bone marrow stromal cells leads to the overproduction of chemokines with osteoclast activity, like interleukin-6. Mm -hmm. Also have the macrophage inflammatory proteins, 1-alpha and 1-beta. Now with the new chemokine nomenclature, the name is uh, CC motif ligand 3 for the MIP-1-alpha, and these are osteoclast uh, chemoattractants and mainly macrophage chemoattractants in order the macrophages to be transformed to osteoclasts. And uh, as a reminder to you, the osteoclasts are originated for the uh, macrophage stem cell. Uh, 
And um, uh, the run ligand is overproduced in the myeloma microenvironment, mainly by the osteocytes, at a lesser extent by the myeloma cell. And what's happening with the osteoprotegerin, which is a decoy receptor of rank ligand? Osteoprotegerin is downregulated in this microenvironment, mainly because the myeloma cell binds osteoprotegerin with the CD138, the CDCAN1, internalize and degrade the osteoprotegerin, so the ratio is in favor of rank ligand. Mm -hmm. We have the activation of osteoclasts that resorb the bone and create the osteolytic lesions. But at the same time, the myeloma cell produces several molecules like the DCOP1 or the soluble freeze-related protein that are inhibitors of osteoblast and they inhibit the osteoblast function. Moreover, we do know during the recent years that osteocyte, which is, uh, as I say, the most common cell in the bones, produce uh, molecules like sclerostin, which is uh, an osteoblast inhibitor. And sclerostin is overproduced in the myeloma environment, and this is very important because now we have also antibodies targeting sclerostin. And the whole process is becoming very, very complex because the DKK1 indirectly enhances the overproduction of rank ligand. And the activated osteoclasts produce molecules like interleukin-6, IGF-1, the B-cell activating factor in April that uh, enhances the growth of myeloma cells. So we have a vicious cycle here that leads to the overproduction and the growth of myeloma cells and also the lytic lesions for our patients. Rank ligand, TKK1, sclerostin, and active in A are important molecules because we have now uh, antibodies that target these molecules for the rank ligand. I'm going to show you the first studies in myeloma for sclerostin. The studies are uh, very near to start. So, what is the treatment for myeloma-related bone disease? For many years, the major treatment is targeting the osteoclast with the bisphosphonate. Now we have another molecule, the anti-rank ligand antibody, the Nosma, that also targets uh, the osteoclast, but in another fashion, because the bisphosphonates are integrated by the osteoclast and they kill the osteoclast because the uh, bisphosphonates are bound to the hydroxyapatite and as the osteoclast resorbs the bone, you see here with the green colors of ledronic acid, as the osteoclast resorbs the bone, they uh, have the they internalize the zoledronic acid that inhibit the mevalonate pathway and kill the osteoclast. So uh, the two most important uh, bisphosphonates, the intravenous uh, zoledronic acid and uh, uh, pamidronate have equal efficacy in multiple myeloma in the era of conventional chemotherapy. But we do know that uh, for patients who have been treated with thalidomide-based regimen, if uh, we give zoledronic acid to our patients versus oral clodronate and the patient has bone disease identified by conventional radiography, the patients uh, have approximately 10 months of overall survival advantage, and this is very important. That is why the zoledronic acid is the most common use bisphosphonate in the treatment of multiple, in the treatment of multiple myeloma. And uh, another important issue is that uh, even patients who have no lesions at baseline, if they receive zoledronic acid, this is from the MRC9 study, you can see that they have approximately half of skeletal-related events co uh, compared to oral clodronate. So the uh, International Myeloma Working Group recommendation about the bisphosphonates is that bisphosphonates should be initiated in patients with myeloma with or without detectable osteolytic lesions. And the beneficial effect of zoledronic acid is uh, in patients without detectable bone lesion uh, is unknown if we use PET-CT or MRI for the detection of lytic lesions or focal lesions respectively. Regarding the duration of treatment, uh, uh, we need to give zoledronic acid continuously if we don't have very good partial response or complete response. If we have complete response or very good partial response, we can stop and then to further continue at relapse, which is very important. Uh, the panel for patients uh, in CR or VGPR, or VGPR believes that uh, the bisphosphonate should be given for at least 12 months and up to two years. How about uh, the adverse event of the bisphosphonates? Too important is the osteonecrosis of the jaw and the acute renal failure that you can see mainly with zoledronic acid. So for patients with renal failure, because the bisphosphonates are cleared by the kidneys and also they create acute uh, kidney injury, if the patient has creatinine clearance of below 30, pamidronate and zoledronic acid are not recommended. Do we have now any alternative on that? The alternative is the denosumab. The denosumab is the first fully human monoclonal antibody against the receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B ligand, 
and in uh, the recent uh, conference of the International Myeloma Workshop in New Delhi, the study compared the nosumab that inhibits all the process uh, of Frank Ligon that I previously shown to you has been reported for the first time by Nupur Raja. This is the study comparing the nosumab with zoledronic acid for the treatment of bone disease in multiple myeloma patients. More than 1,700 patients, one of the largest study in the multiple myeloma era, were randomized to receive either the nosumab at a dose of 120 mg subcutaneously per month versus zoledronic acid 4 mg intravenous. The study was double blind, so there was also placebo, either IV for zoledronic acid or subcutaneous for the nosumab. You can see here the stratification factors, if there was an autologous transplantation or not, the disease of uh, stage ISS1-2 versus 3, if the patient had received novel therapy-based or non-novel therapy-based uh, treatment, if the patient had a previous skeletal-related event or no, and the region in order to see if in Japan or other regions the, the effects are the same. So uh, in this study, the primary endpoint was a non-inferiority of the nosumab versus oledronic acid, and you can see here that there was non-inferiority for the first on study skeletal-related event. However, we have seen a difference after the 12 months that is going to be presented in the next EHA meeting. Regarding overall survival, because there were some reports showing that patients who received the nosumab have an inferior survival, you see that there is no signal of any uh, inferiority or superiority of one of the two drugs regarding survival. But importantly, although progression-free survival was a secondary and exploratory endpoint, you can see that patients who receive uh, the nosumab had a better progression-free survival approximately, as you can see here, uh, six months versus zoledronic acid, and this is, uh, of course, something interesting. Regarding adverse event of interest, I have to tell you that particularly in patients with creatinine clearance <coughs> below 60, the uh, inclusion criteria had creatinine clearance above 30 because we give zoledronic acid in the patient. So for patients who had creatinine clearance between 30 and 60, you can see that the renal problems with zoledronic acid was 26% and the adverse events with the nosumab 13%. So you see double the renal problems and the renal adverse event with zoledronic acid with the nosumab versus the nosumab. So I believe that the nosumab is a very good drug for patients with impaired uh, renal function. And I'm going to uh, stop my talk with the new Kaifoplast International Myeloma Working Group recommendation that has just been submitted by Karaki Yaku to Leukemia for publication just to uh, tell you when we are going to use uh, segment augmentation in the vertebra. So if there is no abnormal neurology in the patient and we have an MRI scan of the whole spine, which is very good, if the pain significantly continues uh, after anti-myeloma therapy, then the segment, the segment augmentation is one of the treatments that can uh, be taken into consideration. Of course, if we have abnormal neurology and there is a bone involvement into the canal spine, then you need a surgery there in order to have a spinal decompression and if uh, uh, the anti-myeloma therapy or the radiotherapy cannot manage to reduce the pain, then also cement augmentation has to be done, and in this paper also the guidelines for the segment augmentation are reported. So in conclusion, the osteolytic bone disease is the main complication of multiple myeloma. The bisphosphonate uh, continues to be the treatment of choice, mainly zoledronic acid because of the overall survival advantage versus oral clodronate. For patients with renal impairment, bortezomib can reverse the renal impairment and then we can give bisphosphonate, but definitely the nosumab uh, probably is going to give a solution for these patients. The nosumab will be the next standard of care based on the study that I showed to you uh, that has also uh, been um, uh, submitted for publication. Its beneficial effects on bone metabolism, along with the possible prolongation of PFS and better renal safety profile, makes it an appealing new treatment for bone disease management in multiple myeloma. And with this, I thank you for your attention.